So I'd like to welcome you to our Tractor Safety Education Reimagined session that's offered today at the 2020 ISASH Virtual Conference. Um, today, our colleagues uh, presenting will be myself, Dee Jepson with Ohio State University, Jill Kilinowski, also with Ohio State University, Aaron Yoder with the University of Nebraska Medical Center, Dina Namuth Kabert with Ohio State University, and Justin Pullen. Pulley from Ohio State University. Our title for our, um, for our session is all about how we have reimagined some of our traditional training programs for agriculture safety training. And the goal of our project with the SAY grant, which is Safety in Agriculture for Youth, is to enhance some of the youth training programs that are currently available. Our intention then is to reduce injuries to the youth populations through curriculum development, where we're going to target high injury causing agents used by these young workers, and also have target audiences of the youth being engaged in agricultural work and their supervised agricultural experiences. This session and our entire grant was funded through a USDA NIFA grant um, through that Youth Farm Safety Education Certificate Program. So within our grant project, we had two approaches to reduce injuries. The first idea was to develop and enhance some current inventory of youth agricultural safety curricula that we will use on our Safety in Agriculture Youth National Clearinghouse. We also wanted to incorporate innovative technology-based learning ideas and different performance tools into some of our existing training materials and then pilot test those end products. So that's the purpose of our presentation today. We have three objectives and you'll get to hear from our team as they describe to you how we have tried to transform the paper and pencil version of those classroom lectures onto an online format, how we're using a new test bank of questions that can be used anytime, any place in a traditional um, tractor safety program, and then a little bit of what we're doing with the virtual, virtual reality training world. So with that, Dr. Yoder, I'm gonna turn it over to you for objective number one. Thanks, Dee, um, and thanks for having us here today. So uh, our first part that we'd like to talk about is the transformation of those paper and pencil classroom-based lectures and testing uh, for the instruction of the National Safe Tractor and Machinery Operation Program to an online platform uh, with some interactive modules. So on the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about uh, what got us to this place. So the uh, development of this online tractor safety program. Uh, it started uh, probably with the original National Safe Tractor and Machinery Operation Program uh, which was the paper-based form in 2001 uh, through a USDA NIFA grant, um, developing some new materials uh, that complied with the Department of Labor regulations for the hazardous occupation order exemption for 14 and 15 year olds, um, and then led to a project that started the creation of this online system uh, that was funded through this uh, youth farm safety mechanism at USDA NIFA in 2010, uh, and the title of that project was Online Farm Safety Education and Certification for 16 to 20 year olds. Some of the major accomplishments of that program was extending the materials that were originally created for 14 to 15 year olds to a little bit of older age group, the 16 through 20 year olds, uh, which improved the reach of the original curriculum that was developed at, starting in 2001. Uh, some of the other major accomplishments of that program were looking at how do we identify a platform to host this on. Um, many universities were going through a transition to different types of course systems, whether it be Blackboard or Moodle, uh, Canvas. There were many of them going out there. Um, around that same time also was the creation of eExtension and some of the learning stuff along with it, eExtension or extension.org. Um, we decided as a group that the campus.extension.org Moodle site was a good place to put it, and we've been growing it at that site ever since. And uh, this original project back in 2010 also helped create some enduring materials that we'll see 
uh, are currently being used in the remodification and the improvement uh, or the reimagining, as we're calling it, of this system. And Dean is going to tell us a little bit more about that. All right, thanks, Aaron. So what I'm going to show you in the next few slides are some screen captures of a new version of the online course. So it still resides at eExtension um, using their Moodle platform. So it's a good access for anyone from different universities to help maintain it as well as to use it. Um, and it's almost ready for public use. Um, so you'll see we've got um, six different lessons. So this coordinates with um, the previous version. Um, when you click on one of those icons, what it will do is open up that lesson content. So D, go ahead and go forward and let's take a look at that. Um, here I've got an example of what you'll see when you open up a lesson. So we've got the different objectives as well as the task sheets that are covered in that particular lesson. When you click on this ebook link, this is where we're going to get to the core of the material, um, which was in there previously. Um, and what we've done is added some interaction components to it. So Dee, let's take a look at what some of that um, is. So here, what we have done is add um, more official learning objectives, um, and, but we've taken the content that was in there before and just repackaged it, um, done some descriptions, alt text for the images, so that way it improves our accessibility of those type of things. Um, go ahead and let's look at the next screenshot. So within this lesson format, we're able to bring in embedded YouTube videos. So these are some work that had been done previously, but weren't necessarily linked directly with this content. And then in this next slide or picture here, you can see that there's different options that we have with what's called an H5P integration. Um, so here we can make like different slide sets where you have both the video as well as a description of the hand signals um, for this example. So it makes it a little bit more interactive. So it's less passive learning and helps to engage the, the students or the learners a little bit. Okay, we'll go to a couple of other examples. We've embedded within these lessons some practice questions. Okay, so there was already um, a comprehensive exam after you complete each lesson that's still in there as well. And if you pass those, then you get a certificate from the online content. So what we want to do is put some practice questions that are within the each lesson to help the students kind of summarize and make sure they got what they needed to learn. So here's just a click and drag type of example. I'm go ahead and we'll show them the answer. Um, so when a student does that, then they click check, and this is what they'll see if they got the answer right or not, and it gives us some feedback. We'll look at the next slide, um, which is showing us some flip kind of examples. So this is like a flip chart. So you've got the, the signal on one side, and the student will click on turn, and then they are going to see this um, answer here. So I'll tell them what that signal represents. And then there's another type of format where you actually give them a picture and ask them a question and they have to answer it. And then go ahead if they get it right or not when they click the they check it and then so in this way I didn't answer it correctly. But the the site will actually give them some feedback on that. Okay, so I think those are the last ones. What I'm going to do now is turn this over to Jill, who's going to be talking about for learners who are working through like a more face-to-face -face written type of training. Uh, thank you, Dina. So I'd like to talk about the test bank of questions that have been used for the NST MOP exam. As we know is that many, we're moving towards online learning, but learning still occurs face-to-face. -face. And what we discovered is that teachers were creating their own exams and there was no standardization of the test bank of the questions that were used for the various components of safety education. So through a dissertation study, a test bank of questions was developed by content experts that really looked at the questions that were already existing and really kind of beefed them up and, and made them more applicable to the content that was being taught. So content validity was established by these content experts, but the next step for looking for an exam to make sure that it has a quality examination is to look for reliability. And reliability improves the quality of the examination. And this looks at students that take the exam to see if there's any kind of uh, wording that needs to be modified or word that needs to be replaced. And it's done through giving it to students and then evaluating the answers. So we've partnered with a department on campus at Ohio State 
called um, Center for Education and Training for Employment. And they have done this before for the Ohio Department of Education for teacher education. So they're very used to testing for reliability. So we're working with them and we determined we wanted to keep the same standard that was already in existence. So any student who earned 70% on these test bank of questions that were being evaluated would be received uh, would receive a acknowledgement for that for that excellence that was learned and they'd be awarded a digital badge and as we know digital badges are really coming into the market there's different companies that are out there but credly is the one that has the market share of the awarding of digital badges these digital badges can be put on to LinkedIn, they can be put on Facebook, um, and instead of having a student having a piece of paper that could be easily lost in those teenage years, they would have a digital component to it. So uh, the step towards evaluating the exams is to receive a Credly digital badge. So what happened? So again, we wanted to reimagine what was happening in the face-to-face -face classroom. Five teachers were recruited from a national um, invitation to facilitate this uh, testing process. That's, we just got started. We had five teachers that came forth and we had a potential for 225 students and we were all excited about to evaluate these questions. But we needed a power um, sample size of 100. So we were going to meet that. Uh, the geographical distribution we were happy with. We had Oklahoma, Florida, California, Pennsylvania, and Montana. Things are going great and then COVID-19 came. And as we know, education in the classroom was turned to online education. And what happened with the different districts that we we're working with is that the district decided that there'd be no consequences for completing online assignments. So even though the teacher was going into the say website and using that material to teach online, the consequences of doing the assignment, reading the assignments and completing the exams at the end, there was no consequence. So we did have one teacher who was um, very engaged, who wanted to pursue this. That was a teacher from Montana. We have 36 students that will be taking the exam to day, today's date, the end of May. 29 have done it uh, so far, and school's ending in a week, and they will complete it. Seven out of 29 achieved a 70%, which means that they did meet the standard, which is 24%. Uh, in the real life classroom, any student who does not achieve it on the first attempt is given a second try with uh, following remediation. So um, we, what we're doing is these students will receive a digital badge for the written exam, not for the practical exam, but for the written exam. So Dee, would you please uh, show the audience what it will look like? So the SAE Advisory Council met virtually um, in March and we had a draft and this was the end result of what people felt the digital batch should look like. So again, this is a draft that will be offered uh, and sent to the students via Credly. Uh, so we wanted to keep the colors of say so that it was very you know, nationally identifiable. And uh, we're looking forward to analyzing the data. Uh, but in the reality, we did need that sample size of 100. So we probably will be extending it into the fall. And the teachers are on board with that because they really did want to be engaged in the process. So thank you very much. And we'd like to now talk about the third objective. Thanks, Jill. Uh, objective number three uh, dealt with creating a virtual reality simulated tractor usage experiment. Uh, and this mainly reflects onto the tractor portion of the STMOP program because uh, one of the main barriers that most people encounter with this is providing a safe place for uh, students to practice, practice uh, tractor and machinery operation, uh, getting enough instructors out there to safely uh, supervise students while they are practicing. So this virtual uh, reality environment that we are trying to uh, produce is giving students a safe space or a safe area to come in and practice tractor and machinery operation. And it also helps them become a little bit more familiar with some of the character, the characteristics and the safety characteristics of a tractor itself. So this program that we're working on trying to produce, uh, there's essentially going to be three levels of experiences or you could refer to as three levels of difficulty within that experience. Uh, the first level is essentially just a, uh, a room with a 3D modeled tractor in there that students can walk around, look at the tractor, and pick out different points uh, on the tractor that allows them to look at the different characteristics of the tractor, such as 
uh, the PTO shaft, uh, the uh, the uh, seat belt, the ROP system allows them to learn what those things are meant for and how they work, and some of the different other characteristics about it. The second level of this is a guided uh, walkthrough of safe tractor or machinery startup and moving the machine. Uh, this is all done through a holographic uh, instructor within the room that walks them through the steps to safely do this. And then the last level, or uh, what we refer to as the third room, this allows students to go in there and on a self-guided uh, walkthrough and startup of that tractor of that machine that they've been looking at. So this allows the students to actually go through and put to use what they learned through the past couple of levels, uh, and then also drive this through a simulated virtual environment. Uh, so this could be a farm environment, a road environment, any type of environments that we may be driving tractors or machines through. Uh, one of the bonuses of using a virtual reality room like this is, for example, some of the examples that we have here shows uh, how detailed we can make these rooms. The first picture here shows an example of a biology lab that the company that we're using to develop our program uh, has done in the past for science education or science learning. Uh, this, uh, this lab here has a 3D virtual frog that can be picked up, opened up, and practically gone through just like a regular di dissection lab in school would be done like. We can then put in here a 3D model tractor, which is in the next picture. Uh, this will allow students to be able to walk around this 3D tractor, see, how, see it, pick out different components of it, and then be able to work through uh, how to start up and how to work through that tractor. And plus the bonus with this is, is it allows the flexibility of VR to be able to be distributed through multiple, platform, uh, multiple platforms. Uh, the, the platform that we're planning on using with this one is the, Ver, uh, is the Oculus Rift or the Oculus uh, Quest headsets. Uh, this can also be given through uh, Microsoft stores, Steam, various other gaming and, uh, and program platforms like those to be able to, to be distributed. And then if you, uh, and then Dee will come back and talk about uh, so the next thing's here. Yes, thank you. As we finish up our session, we really appreciate the chance to share with you how we see agriculture safety education being reimagined into these um, new types of educational platforms. Just changing a little bit of what we're doing traditionally, um, but putting it in a twist where we can enhance the technology learning, really increase the engagement of the youth in the program, um, controlling some cost in that curriculum delivery, helping those students connect with the content, um, their online instructor or their in-classroom instructor, and with the other students in their rooms. Um, we think that this is developing some new delivery for safety knowledge. Uh, it's enhancing what we can do geographically, making it consistent so that what you might experience in Ohio might be the same as what you could experience in Montana or Mississippi. And um, even augmenting the, the existing classrooms that we know where, where we have great teachers out there providing this education, but then we provide them with a high quality interface with some other platforms to enhance their um, in-person classrooms. And then just complementing what we know that the today's youth are, are wanting to do with this. And because we're doing all this with the COVID, we're learning a lot too, that maybe this is the way to be teaching tractor safety education, that we can put it online, let them test online, let them practice driving a little bit before they go out to take their, their other testing. So this is conclusion um, of our presentation today with our team members listed in our, um, with their email contacts. And I'd be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to our academic advisors. Um, Dr. Aaron Yoder is with us today, but also Dr. Michael Pate. Um, I have him at Penn State and I apologize uh, since this time he is back in Utah State. And then Karen Funkenbush, um, she is at the University of Missouri. So with that, we thank you very much. And thanks for attending.